Welcome back to Mentor Nation, the podcast for entrepreneurs looking for real mentorship, real strategies, and real stories so that you can go out and build your dreams. I'm your host, John Abbas, and it's time for another episode, so buckle your seatbelt and let's go. Hello, Mentor Nation family, and welcome to the show. John Abbas here as your host with a very special guest today that I just know is going to give you massive inspiration, mindset, and belief for you to go out and overcome whatever you need to accomplish your dreams. I'm joined today by Chris Cavallini, who is the founder and CEO of NutritionSolutions.com. His company delivers meals all over the country, as well as coaching and everything else you could imagine to be the best version of yourself, even if you are super busy. Tons of celebrities, tons of professional athletes look to NutritionSolutions.com to stay on top of their health for performance and everything else. And, you know, what's really crazy is in just a few short years, Chris went from buying meals from a catering company and then flipping them for a small profit to a nationwide powerhouse company that does over $10 million per year and growing exponentially. He's been featured in Forbes and a ton of other publications, but to me, what is most amazing is his journey here. He grew up in some of the worst circumstances you can imagine, as you'll see in the episode, and he was arrested 17 times before his 18th birthday. And what we talk about and what we focus in on this interview is just how he made the decision to change his circumstances. You know, we dive into exactly how he went from making that decision to six figures from six figures to seven figures, and then building it from seven figures to eight figures, and just what mindsets and actions he had to have and do in order to be able to do that. And if if that wasn't enough, he was able to do all of this while hiring and training people that nobody else would have given a chance to, such as ex-cons and those with troubled pasts. You are in for a huge treat, and I want to ask that you make sure you take notes because this episode blew me away, and I know that it will do the same for you. All right, Chris, thank you so much for being on Mentor Nation, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Me too. And so just to kind of get started so that the audience can know you a little bit, I just wanted to ask you one quick question, and that's, you know, what accomplishment in your life are you most proud of up to this point and why? I get that question fairly routinely. And (laughs) my answer, I think, usually surprises the person asking. I obviously have accomplished, you know, my fair share of successes to this point. I definitely feel that I've racked up a lot more failures than successes, if I'm being (laughs) completely honest. But if, if there was something that, you know, I had to just pin down as being the, like the thing or like series of things that, that I'm most proud of and that, you know, makes me experience the deepest feelings of, uh, you know, just gratitude and, and fulfillment, I would say the hand that, you know, I've played in developing some of the people that work within my company, Nutrition Solutions, we uh, basically have a culture that's geared around second chances and personal development. I proudly employ a gratuitous amount of convicted felons, former drug addicts, people who you know have served lengthy tenures in prison, and basically our culture is basically geared around the process that I followed that allowed me to go from you know being a drug dealer to you know a multi-time Forbes featured entrepreneur. Those things are basically personal development, physical fitness gratitude and giving back. So there's been a lot of people that have come to work at Nutrition Solutions that were Mm -hmm. at a completely different part of their life. And I mean, whether they just been released from prison, whether, you know, they were currently still residing in a halfway house and everything in between. And basically, you know, by putting them through the process, by putting them through the system that, you know, I've basically built upon within my company that again, replicated the process that I followed to change my life. It's been pretty cool seeing some of these people just evolve into just, just higher caliber version of themselves and be able to create a better life for themselves and, and provide a better life for their, uh, for their families. Man, that's so incredible. And I want to dive into that a little later because we're going to talk a little bit about scaling a business and is as hard as that is to do in any business, the fact that you've been able to do that with that philosophy, with, you know, taking people that, you know, come from those types of backgrounds and situations and molding them while at the same time scaling. And I'm sure, you know, that's a feat 
in and of itself, man. I just, I can't wait to dive into that in just a minute. And so, you know, to kind of get started, I want to get into a little bit about your journey, if you don't mind, because, you know, today you're, you're running an eight figure business called Nutrition Solutions. You're helping tens of thousands of people get healthier, live longer, feel better. You've been featured. And look better naked. Let's not yeah, forget yeah. about that. And look better naked. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sure after people listen to this podcast, they're immediately going to go to Google and, and look at your picture. You're in incredible shape. And, you know, it just seems that you have the world at your fingertips. But, you know, the crazy thing is, is that wasn't always the case. You know, you grew up in, in really rough circumstances and were arrested 17 times before your 18th birthday. And I just, I was hoping that maybe you could tell us a little bit about that journey and how you made that transition. Yeah. So basically, I was the product of a 16-year-old mother, 16-year-old father as well. My father took off when my mother was pregnant because she was unstable. She had issues multitude of issues, substance abuse, just, you know, mental issues, things of that nature. And just because of uh, the lack of stability, you know, she's a kid <laughs> at that point, they were both right. kids. The lack of stability just basically wasn't the ideal dynamic for a child. So I was basically pulled out of her custody multiple times, spent some time, you know, growing up in, in some foster homes, group homes, ended up uh, living with my biological grandmother. So I never really had, uh, my father was never around, never, you know, even saw a picture of him. So I didn't really have a traditional structured upbringing, right? I never really had the discipline. I didn't have like an authority figure. My you know, my grandmother was really the authority figure and she was battling her own demons based off of what, you know, my mother had put her through. So, and, you know, just due to some of the things that happen when, you know, you're bouncing around like that, you don't have that stability, you don't have that structure. Psychologically, it takes its toll. And again, at that time, I'm not aware of this. I'm not right. like, psychologically aware of, of, of what is happening, but basically it got to a point where I just developed a tremendous amount of anger issues, resentment issues, deep-rooted insecurity and just started to lash out in different ways. And basically, it kind of really bubbled up to the surface when I got in high school and just, you know, basically had a kind of larger platform to act out and just started just acting like, like an idiot, man. Just like, you know, getting in fights, being reckless, doing things that basically drew attention to myself for all the wrong reasons. But at that time, I was desperately craving significance so bad that I obviously would do whatever I had to do to get it. And again, like human beings, we all need to feel significant right. in some way. And, and, you know, some of us get it in very positive, productive ways that, you know, impact the world and, and help other people. Others, you know, break the law, commit crime and just do dumb shit. But either yeah. way, it got to a point where I started getting arrested, you know, developed a pretty bad reputation in town that I was uh, going to high school in. Inevitably, you know, as mentioned, I was arrested 17 times prior to my 18th birthday, ultimately right. the state of Massachusetts. Gave me an ultimatum. They realized that I wasn't getting it. I wasn't learning from the numerous arrests. And finally, I was given an ultimatum to either join the military or go to jail for seven months. Right. So I subsequently joined the military, spent <laughs> Five of the most exciting years of my life as a Navy deep sea diver. Military, for someone like me, it was a big deal. I mean, the military is great for, for anybody, but for That's a kid right. who had no discipline, had no structure, had no just really moral compass, it helped me develop routine. It taught me the importance of uh, attention to detail, the importance of maintaining high standards, and basically just help me grow up and, and, and become a man and, and start thinking better. And it did, it did another thing that proved to be one of the main catalysts, I believe, and helping me kind of begin to turn my life around. And, and that was, it got me out of the environment and away from the people and kind of like the energies that, you know, was contributing and had contributed to me becoming the person I was growing up. And that's a big deal. The environment that, you know, we spend the most time in, the people we surround ourselves with, I mean, objectively, we know that those things dictate our mindset and they either raise or lower our standard. And, you know, I was who I was back then. The military got me out of that. I looked at it as an opportunity to kind of recreate myself, redefine myself, and just basically just become something more. And I, you know, at the age of 23, my tenure was, was coming up. I had an opportunity to reenlist. I decided not to because I didn't want to leave Jacksonville, Florida, where I was stationed at the time. I mean, they were offering me a significant amount of money at that time to uh, reenlist. But I think, you know, looking back on it, I'm not sure that I was aware of it at the time. But I think that the, the reason that I turned down that money and turned down you know, the opportunity to stay in and, and continue to grow, you know, as a member of one of the most elite communities in all the military was because of my deep-rooted fear, maybe 
leaving somewhere and I, I would have to move to a different city and right. just maybe leaving and then having to go to go backwards, like not have the like stability and the, the, you know, the friends and just like the quality of life that, you know, I developed for myself in Jacksonville, which, you know, obviously was substantially better than what uh, I experienced growing up in, uh, in Boston. So getting out of the military prematurely wasn't the best move for me. I went, you know, one day to the next, I had all the discipline, all the structure, all the purpose to literally not having any of that. I got out with, <laughs> I got out with no plan. I mean, I had a plan, but it wasn't really a plan because, you know, there was massive gaps in it. But, you know, as a young guy, you just think that you know, you'll figure it out or you're not really thinking. And uh, got out, started working in a strip club because I needed to make some money. Spent a couple of years doing that. And that just wasn't for me, man. Like there was somebody right. as insecure as I was, somebody who had the, the temperament and just it wasn't a good environment for me to be in i was finding myself getting in just constant conflict and fights with the customers and i didn't get along with the uh, with the girls that work there the co- like people who work there i just it wasn't a good environment for me and, and, and my the person i became when i walked through those doors it just got to a point where i just I, I didn't like myself i was drinking at work to make the shifts more tolerable inevitably just decided enough was enough ended up quitting the strip club and became a full-time drug dealer. Wow. So, so this is crazy because, you know, your story has a little bit of a twist. So instead of, you know, your life going in one direction and then the Navy shaped you and disciplined you and then you got out and that's how you led to be an entrepreneur. You went yeah. a little bit backwards first before you yeah. took a step forward. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I slipped back into my old patterns, man, for sure. I mean, as I said, I mean, human beings, we need purpose. We need a reason to get up in the morning and like an objective to work toward it. We don't have that. That's where feelings of desperation, anxiety, and this overall feeling like shit come from. You right. don't have purpose. Like you're fucked. So <laughs> I, I, I literally like went from, you know, having purpose and, 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 and having something that may be significant in a positive, productive way. I, I was very proud to serve my country. I was very proud to, you know, be a, a Navy deep sea diver. You know, and basically, yeah, I lost the structure and kind of slipped back into some of my old patterns, so to speak. But, you know, at the time, I I didn't really see, like, even morally, you know, it was illegal, obviously, what I was doing. Again, like, it didn't really occur to me at the time that it it was that big of a deal. And also, I think when I started doing that, I I didn't really have any expectation of how long I was going to do it for. And and basically, you know, it it ended up getting out of control where it was about six years I spent, you know, doing that. I didn't work man. I didn't have a normal job. I was selling anabolic steroids and living a very carefree life, just partying all the time, like, you know, going out four or five, six nights a week, just bottle service, just like living, being very flashy, spending all the money, you know, spending the money that I was making probably faster than it was coming in and just uh, ultimately got to a point where, you know, things started to change. I started to get a little, a little older, started to think more about the future. I had other drug dealer friends that started to get, you know, in trouble, get sent to prison. Everybody was snitched on everybody. Ultimately, my best friend at the time, still my best friend to this day and actually works for my company, he ended up getting sent to prison. He got arrested for, you know, he was, he was a dealer as well. He was dealing different stuff, but ended up getting sent to prison. And, you know, that was a primary catalyst into me really taking a hard look at myself and and, and understanding that I needed to make some changes and I needed to like act quick. So basically just, you know, went to someone who turned me on to personal development and said that I needed to spend all of my free time, you know, in the books, reading, watching YouTube videos. This was like 2010, 2011. And, you know, I started to do that and I started to kind of like feel a little different. I felt like, you know, I still wasn't where I obviously anywhere, but right. I was feeling like at least I was like kind of on the path. I, I was taking some sort of action to kind of move me in the right direction, making a long story short, man, ultimately got to a point where, you know, I needed to not just be consuming this information. I needed to act on it. One of the right. things that I'd read that was a, a huge catalyst and pivotal point for me was, uh, you know, the importance of giving back and contribution and just basically uh, serving other people beyond, you know, your own needs and just giving without the expectation of getting anything in return. And, you know, back then I didn't really have much and nor did I really care about giving back or helping right. people. But I'm reading it in the books. It seemed like a, a thing that, you know, like fundamentally it, it seemed like a, a nice thing to do. So basically went, sought out an opportunity to, you know, go volunteer to church and basically help set up, break down and serve members of the homeless that, you know, were in need of a, a hot meal. Right. I, I showed up that day, again, showed up there for selfish reasons, showed up there to fix myself and to, because, you know, I read in the books that I needed to do that. And, you know, the books were right. Man. When I was there, 
within 10 minutes, I, I felt something I never felt before. I, I became just overwhelmed with this deep feelings of, of just pride, gratitude, purpose, and perspective. I and mean, here I am feeling sorry for myself, right. you know, thinking that my life's fucked up, thinking that, you know, like my circumstances are, you know, bad. And, you know, here we are at this, uh, this, uh, the, this facility that, you know, this church has set up this uh, dinner for homeless people who some, you know, lined up around the building for two hours just to make sure that they were able to, to get a meal. And that really changed my life, man. That made me feel things and, and, and experience emotions I've never felt before. Basically, yeah, basically it got me realizing that I wanted to feel those feelings all the time. I, I wanted to do something with my life that I was able to feel like that all the time. I truly had no idea what that was, but I just took that with me and I thought about it and I thought about it and I kept giving back. I kept volunteering. I kept just doing things that make me, made me feel like a productive member of society, even though I really wasn't because of what I was doing. And ultimately, you know, just with, with the law of attraction and, you know, mm -hmm. my self-belief continuing to work on the personal development the opportunity presented itself. And, you know, lo and behold, Nutrition Solutions, the company, you know, that my company now, it was born. What it was then, complete night and day. But basically, you know, I started up this business where I think I had like 10 customers who were like mostly like friends of mine or acquaintances from like the nightclub, the nightclub scene, which I was very active in at the time. <laughs> I didn't have a website. I didn't have a business, any sort of like insurances. I didn't have, I mean, man, I didn't have, I didn't have much. I, I basically had the people meet up in a parking lot that was centrally located to where, you know, they all resided. When I started, there was a station wagon that a friend of mine owned. We'd load the, the bags of food in the back of the station wagon put a couple ice blankets over it. And, you know, basically our storefront was a parking lot in a strip mall <laughs> that was centrally located in Jacksonville to where the 10 people lived. You know, that, that's basically how Man. it started. It was very humble beginnings. That's crazy. I want to interrupt just for just a second because yeah, I want to backtrack because I know that a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, especially even me when I was just trying to get my feet wet, you know, I was always addicted to reading the books and listening to the podcast just to figure out like what was that that catalyst and that turning point and I just want to reiterate it seems like you know one of the major catalysts that started you on the path to being better was when your friend Lee went to jail and then yeah, to, that led you we went to prison wow he went to prison yeah. and then yeah. that set you on a path in which you reached out and I think I read this or listened to this that you went to a mentor of yours and and he told you there's two things that he told you to do, get into personal development and start hanging around with people better than you. Am I saying that yep. right? Yep. That's exactly what he said. Awesome. And so that led obviously to serving people and that feeling that you get obviously of gratification, which is something that I know Tony Robbins talks about all of the time, mm -hmm. you know, led you on a path, which I'm assuming is why you have such a great business and philosophy today of just serving customers, impacting lives. Like every time I listen to you, it's never about making money. It's always about how can I serve people? And that gives you joy. So here we are, you're starting a company. And this is where this gets to me so interesting because you start a meal prep company and just like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg in their garage, I mean, you're literally doing it old school and just trying to make it happen. Yeah. And if I'm reading correctly, you started by just buying food from a catering company. Is that right? Yeah, pretty. So basically what, the way it started was there was a company that basically was doing, they were selling like, you know, they were selling quote unquote healthy food. And I started mm -hmm. as a customer of, of theirs. And because I want, this is something I wanted. I, I mean, I was into fitness and, you know, back then, like one of the things that I realized when I was kind of, I didn't really have a lot of people in my life that were better than me or, or, you know, at that point, why would anybody who was successful want to hang out with someone like me? So I started kind of going to places where successful people were and just like more upscale, you know, networking events, uh, lounges, restaurants, and just kind of started observing right. just the environment, the, the people, the way they interacted, their mannerism, just the way they dressed. I mean, all these things. And one of the things mm -hmm. I noticed was most of the successful people that I was taking note of, they, you know, they, they were fit. They were like in shape. And I mean, I, I was, I was fit, you know, back then as well, but like, I thought that, that was really interesting. And, you know, obviously I wasn't, I had nothing that I could be successful at, at the time I was, I was right. starting out, I was starting out, starting out. And I just basically took note of that and thought to myself, well, like, look, obviously this is, this is a pattern here between these people. Like, this is something that I can take immediate control of and, and like, I can start leveling up. 
with my workouts, I can start eating good. At the time, I really wasn't eating good. I was young. I was eating good relative to what I knew at the time, and it, which right. wasn't a whole lot. So basically, you know, I seeked out like a way to start eating better. I certainly didn't want to cook. I didn't want to have to <laughs> not only spend the time cooking, I didn't want to learn how to cook. I used to have to cook for myself. And like when I was growing up, I used to cook rice, ramen noodles and, and spaghetti. <laughs> I had spaghetti and I used to put ketchup on the spaghetti because I had nothing else to put on there. And I think that might have like damaged me like mentally as far as like my willingness to cook. I never. But it tastes so good. <laughs> it did at the time. I mean, if it did at the time, being to be completely honest, but. So basically, you know, I started getting meals from this company, just saw an opportunity there and I was, I was getting them more and more customers because I knew a lot of people and they just became pretty inconsistent. And I just, I noticed, I didn't see any longevity in that situation. So mm. I just saw an opportunity there, man. And I went to a catering company who already had the, like, you know, they had the setup, they had the operation, they had the business, they had the team, they had the equipment. And I basically said, Hey, I have this many customers. If I come to you and I need this many meals, I can give you this will that work? And then, you know, whatever negotiation took place. And I was, yeah, basically outsourcing the whole thing through a catering company that was already kind of standalone in place, operationally sound. And I started buying the meals from them and flipping them for low profit to my customers at the time. How long did that last? Did that take you to six figures or like, when did you have yeah. to Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So probably, actually, probably not. That probably, well, no, no, that you know, six figures isn't that much. So yeah, under that model, for sure, we were, uh, we were making, you know, six figures. And then, you know, I think about two plus years in is when I finally got, you know, my own facility, you know, started operating. Basically, you know, I had hired uh, a chef, and, you know, a couple, a couple cooks, whatever. And, you know, at that point, we had our own setup. I, I was renting a kitchen out of a event hall. I mean, again, like I didn't have like a lot of money at the time. Right. And it was my first time ever setting anything up. I didn't really know what to do. So I'm just I'm trying to figure it out. Just like everybody does during the, uh, during the beginning. And yeah. And then, you know, we started doing, we started having our own facility there. I started to see a little success. I mean, again, I, I say success. It was success at the time. Like right, right back at, right now, it's, it's fucking embarrassing. But uh, three years in, man, like things are going like pretty good. I put like quotes in the air when I say that. Again, pretty good at the time. Like we're growing and there's a lot of problems. And, and again, I'm a different person. I don't have a solid team because I'm not a good leader. How can I have a good team if I'm not a good leader? And basically, you know, I, I had successfully transitioned out of drug dealing. That took me, I would say, I don't know, maybe a year plus into my business to 100% isolate myself from that. Essentially, I remember one day, what I remember to be a very productive day, I was feeling pretty good about whatever was happening at the time and the direction we were going. Basically, I came home one day and walked in the lobby of the building I was living in at the time, and I had two plainclothes undercover police officers uh, there oh, to man. arrest me. And they were arresting me for crimes that I had, in fact, committed three years prior. So take a minute to kind of just Ooh. digest that life that I lived for many years, you know, like I, I transitioned away from that. I had started to do things to, to better myself as a man, to better myself as a businessman. I was very active in the community. Again, like, you know, giving back, that was like a huge, that was a very important thing to me, you know, between working with the homeless, less fortunate, donating food when we could. I had multiple wounded warriors that I mentored. I was on the path to becoming a better person. And, right. Uh, then, you know, karma, man, it, it does what it does. I mean, I had to answer for my reckless past. And basically that situation turned my entire life upside down. My bill was half a million dollars. I mean, I didn't have that. I had to, you know, you bail out at 10% of that, but that was everything. And they, you know, wanted me to snitch and I had no interest in doing that. It's just taking responsibility. I mean, I used to live my life very differently. I used to be of the mindset that, you know, because of my past, because of the issues, issues that I've had with my mother and the, the, the resentment that I would always have anger issues towards women that I would always be violent that, you know, because of uh, the abuse that I was subjected to as right. a kid that I would always be insecure. I'd always lash out and all these fucking things that these stories that, like that, uh, oh, that, you know, my father was never around. So like whatever, you know, I, I would say all these things and I actually said it enough times that I started to believe it. And I used to use it as justification as to why I, you know, oh, well, this is why I'm, 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 I'm dealing. This is why I'm, could never do anything. I've been arrested right. so many times. Who would ever want to hire me? How can I ever get a good job? It's all bullshit. But right. again, at the time, I really believe in it. The fact is, man, taking responsibility over my past, taking responsibility over what I've done, taking responsibility over not, you know, some of the things that I experienced growing up, I 
certainly couldn't have prevented, but I absolutely have the ability and opportunity to control how it affects me in my present and not allow it to have that power over me where it right. hinders my growth you know, in, in the future. So taking personal responsibility was like a huge catalyst for me to actually start making shit happen. I, I couldn't sit there and, and basically get myself to even consider for one second and entertain the thought of destroying somebody else's life, setting somebody else up, sending someone else to prison because I was unwilling to be held accountable for my own actions. And I told them that what I remember to be pretty respectfully I wasn't, you know, like being, you know, like, hey, fuck you. I would never do that. <laughs> Thug life to the day I died, like type shit. Man, they don't like when you do that. You know, That's they, right. the, the way they do what they do is by, you know, getting people to cooperate. That makes their life easier. It makes their job easier. And hey, like, you know, whatever, I get it. So yeah, they tried to make an example out of me. I went through a very painful process, man, three months where the offer they gave me was 24 months firm. They weren't coming off that. Normally, uh, when you get a plea offer initially, it's like a negotiation, like a business negotiation. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's an offer and then your attorney, you go back and forth, you meet somewhere in the middle. They weren't willing to negotiate. Neither was I, you know, and basically uh, against my attorney's advice, I told them, I'm like, look, I, I don't want to take this offer. I refuse to take this offer. It's not that I'm afraid to go to prison. I, I I'd already actually mentally gotten myself to the point, like prepared where if I had to go, I was like, all right, I'm going to go in there. Like, you know, I've read about like people getting college degrees or like getting this like crazy <laughs> yeah. amount of education and the time. And I'm like, I'm going to be that fucking guy. Maybe not of the college degree, just I'm going to do something in there that, that, that is inspiring. I'm going to do something in there to where as I come out, this is going to be just another legendary piece to like what will be the greatest comeback of all comebacks and just trying to mentally get myself there, bro, to feel better about, I mean, I mean that time, I mean, I, I, it was a very tough time I mean, thinking that everything that I've started to work for and turn my life around, you know, it was all of a sudden that it was all going to be gone. I'd be sent away. And, you know, of course I would lose my business. I'd lose everything. Right. But uh, I had a team that I cared about. Our company was much smaller at the time. So it was a lot more intimate. I knew a lot about these people individually. I knew a lot about their families. I knew a lot about their responsibilities. I knew that a lot of them would be hard up. Again, I had some convicted felons and, and ex-cons and such that worked, uh, worked for me back then. And I knew they'd be hard up. And if I got sent to prison, there was no way that my business would sustain, you know, prof prof right. probably when it went more than a week, if I'm being completely honest. So I knew I had to fight for them, man. It wasn't just about me. So I fought and I, I told my attorneys that, look, I, that against their advice, I told them that I, I, I didn't want to get up there and insult the judge. I didn't want to insult the police prosecutor and, and act like the two times that I've broken the law were just so happened to be the two times that I got set up that they had me for it. I was like, I got to own this. I said, I've made some changes. I made a lot of changes. And I think that it'll be very easy to show that. I, I believe it'll be it'll be easy for people to see that and, and they can judge me, not necessarily based off of what I've done, but you know, but who I am now. And I think that they will look at that and that they'll take that into consideration. And I think that that will give us a favorable income. Now, the favorable income was just, you know, basically hoping to not get sent to prison because I had, right. I, had ag I had agreed to plead guilty because I was guilty. I was guilty. So I didn't want to go in there and act like something. And, and I didn't want to lie. I didn't want to, I lived a lie for so many years, just the thought of just like having to go in and, and, and lie and just be, be put under oath. It just, it was too stressful for me. Right. And I just had no interest in doing it. Long story short, man, the day of sentencing came, I walked in there fully prepared to not walk out on my own free will. You know, as I sat there in front of the judge and she's, you know, reading off the charges and the, the, the potential sentences each one carry, they'd give me an offer, a plea offer of 24 months. Now, when you don't accept the offer, you run the risk of getting sent to prison for significantly longer. That's the upside of taking the deal is they give you a deal and it saves them the resources, the time, the money, the manpower. Basically, man, in a shocking turn of events, like, you know, there was about a hundred people that showed up that day to support me, to speak on my behalf. I had a very compelling mitigation packet, you know, between uh, disabled wounded warriors who showed up there to testify, people in the military that I serve with that flew in in uniform to be there with wow. me on that day. It sent a strong message, man. It was in a shocking turn of events. The judge uh, addressed me in court and basically said that, you know, she'd been on the bench for 25 years and she'd seen a lot. She said that uh, one thing that she hasn't seen is somebody that has been able to successfully rehabilitate themselves on their own the way that I have. And, and you know, furthermore, she, she had mentioned the purpose of prison is rehabilitation. And she said that being that I had successfully 
accomplish that on my own, that she didn't see or feel a need to send me to prison. And she also told me that I should be very proud of myself for everything that I've done. And that was just, yeah, man, that, that was a big deal for me. It was very emotional. It was the last fucking thing you would ever expect to hear when you're standing in front of a judge at your weakest, lowest moment, expecting, expecting the worst, hoping for the best. And I got an opportunity, man, that day. I got a second chance. I got a new lease on life. And I got off uh, with a year of felony probation, which was like the minimum they could have given me. And, you know, from that day forward, that's when I really went all in. That's, I mean, I, I was never all in before that. In my mind, right. I was, but my mind wasn't even all in. So how could I think? It, what I was thinking wasn't the, the reality. And I went really all in. I started to just do everything that I fucking could to just pay it forward to the universe for the, the gift that it had given me. The, I mean, fuck, I could still be in prison right now. That's I could right. legitimately be in prison right now. So yeah, and then, you know, that, that was uh, three and a half years ago. Do you think that experience right there shaped you into a much better leader to go back out and run your company? Because I know that you, you said you struggled with, you know, I'm not a leader, but do you think that experience is what really helped you? In my mind back then, I was a leader, but I wasn't. I mean, look, right. like, I mean, I had people underneath me. I owned a company. I guess I managed people that didn't make me a leader. Yeah. I mean, that's when I started to really focus on the things that were important to develop the infrastructure that I wanted to make our company, Nutrition Solutions, you know, what it is today. I mean, back then we didn't really have any culture. I mean, that, that word was thrown around, but there was no culture. There was no, there was no ecosystem. And I realized from that point that I needed to, you know, dedicate my life to serving other people. And, you know, one of our core values in Nutrition Solutions is help people. And obviously we do that with the people, our customers and stuff. And look, there's, you know, when we get a message from a customer that says that we literally changed every area of their life, they were 80 pounds, 100 pounds, 150 pounds overweight. And, you know, now they're, they're in good health. They're able to spend time with their kids. They're able to do these things they're never able to do. Their whole life is different. Like, don't, I'm very grateful. It feels right. great every single time. But to be perfectly honest at this point, that's the expectation. That is what we go to work every day to do. We, go, we don't go in the work to, to prepare healthy meals. We go into work every day to change lives. And the way that we do that is by taking a very offensive, hands-on approach with our customers and not just providing them the tools, but providing them the resources, providing them the support, the coaching, the accountability, the education. So when you have that model set up, I mean, yeah, like that's what's going to happen. It's like, okay, yeah, well, we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do. But the thing that I, you know, when I say really dedicate and kind of lock in on helping people change your life, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the team at Nutrition Solutions. And I've been able, you know, to, to grow the company. I say I, it's no I. I mean, we've been able to grow the company. I started as a one-man operation and I've had some amazing people that have worked with me throughout the years. And, and you know, right now I have the best team that I've ever had by, fuck, by a landslide. But the fact is up until, you know, like the last year or so, it was tough, man. I didn't have a lot of experienced people. I didn't have uh, people with a lot of skills. I made the decision to just make things what's even like a normally hard thing, you know, a hell of a lot more harder by just right. having a bunch of like misfits and convicts and, you know, people like, you know, so the battling substance abuse, like that was my team. And I had to basically, I had to become a leader, man. When you have people like that, Right. You have to step up. You have to lead by example. You have to deploy empathy. You have to hold them accountable. You have to coach them. You have to train them. You have to, you have to actually care about them. Yeah, that's been the strategy, man. And that's what's allowed us to take the next step and get to the next level is by deploying a mindset of caring. And it starts with me. It starts with me, with you know my team. It starts with us as a team, with our customers. It starts with us as a team in the local community. We do a lot of work. I pay these guys to do community service because again, giving back, getting involved, this is something that helped me change my life. And I want them to do all the things that I did. And I know, uh, you know, the fact is I, I could tell them, you know, whatever I did this, this, let's go do it. Will some of them do it? Yeah, probably right. maybe half if I'm lucky, but if I can, you know, force that result and basically put them in a position to do the things that I've done to change my life, which is, you know, improve my physical fitness, my mental toughness. I pay them to work out, do uh, two workouts a week, very, very hard, like high, like people are like, you know, like it's not like a little like patch on the ass, like, hey, like good job. It's like people like falling out, like we're in the Florida, the heat, it's humid as fuck. Like we get after it. And, you know, when we do that, not only are we getting physically in better condition, but mentally, you know, there's an opportunity there to just take, take advantage of as far as leveling up your mental toughness, which a lot of people lack in this country. 
Man, this is this is so awesome. Just I can tell it's these little things that have really gr- helped you grow your company into what it is. And I'm super clear, and I just want to shift gears for just a minute if you don't mind. Like, no, I'm not at all. Super clear on how you went from decision to six figures. You know, it was a shift in mindset, and you've had the work ethic. Now, I just want to ask you because I know a lot of entrepreneurs, especially this podcast, it's a lot of entrepreneurs that they're motivated but they just struggle with scale. Like how can I get outside of just me? And I'm just so interested to see, you know, on your journey from six to seven figures, you know, I've got the little things, I've got the focus on customers, but at what point did you really start focusing on building a brand and and team building? And and how did that, how did that play into taking you to the next level just to set up? Yep. So that, Actually, I mean, we were at seven figures without me really even focusing on building a brand, like a very low, a very low seven figures. But the game really changed after I got in trouble, after I was given my second chance. I, at that point, went all in and like all in meant all in. I was never fully committed to my business. And again, now I'm aware of this fact. So I started to just show up every day. I started to like take the time. I mean, personal development was important to me. So now, I'm actually all in on personal development. I'm doing it every day, not some of the time. I mean, I used to say, oh, I do personal development. I'm on this personal development. But I really wasn't doing it because I wasn't doing it all the time. And in order to get the true benefit, you have to do it all the time. The other thing, the, the, the big thing was spending not just the time on educating myself and investing in my own self-education continuously, but mandatorily taking the time, structuring time out to developing my people. See, entrepreneurs these days, they always, you know, will say things, oh, it's hard to find good people and this, that, and this person, you know, just won't, they just won't step up and I want them to take ownership and all this. But the the fact is like, as entrepreneurs, I mean, we probably have never, there's no entrepreneur that's ever cared as much about someone else's business as they do their own. And it's pretty irresponsible to believe that other people are going to naturally and organically just care about your business as much as you do, that people are going to do naturally as good of a job as you do. So, you know, what the, the step that a lot of people are missing is the development of the team. I mean, I right. spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year, the last three years on the personal development of my team, whether, I mean, every day we have mandatory personal development within the company, they're getting paid for that. We have gratitude exercise every morning. We start off with literally 90 seconds of gratitude. We're just taking in into our physiology, priming ourselves to feel as good as our bodies and minds are designed to feel. You know, I I send my executives to leadership seminars all over the country. I mean, I'm continuously making the investment in my team, which allows them to evolve. I mean, we have training every single day in some capacity at Nutrition Solutions. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's two ways to get better. Experience, which takes a long fucking time and training. And, you know, unfortunately, I think some insane statistic, like 95% of companies, the only training they offer their employees is during the onboarding process. So how are you going to get better as fast as you want to get better, as as fast as you want to scale, if you're not putting the time into your fucking team? Like people don't, people don't, people there are some people who don't care. Don't get me wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. But like, look, that's part of it. You have to identify that and get rid of those people. But there's other people out there. The majority of people out there just don't know how to care. And it's your responsibility as a leader to teach them how to care, to teach them how to do things. And moreover, explain to them exactly why they are doing things the way that they are doing them towards. They have a fundamental understanding and now they can go into it and, and do it with that extra level of care and that extra level of attention to detail and take pride and, and such. You know, at, at our company, we don't put customers first. We put our team first. And when you do that, then the customers will always be taken care of. Every team member at Nutrition Solutions is responsible for customer service. Every team member at Nutrition Solutions, whether it's the person who is washing the dishes to the you know top level executive, every single person understands that the work in front of them is not the big picture. It's a role. It's an important role in the spoke of the wheel. That you know that if any of those spokes in that wheel are not present, we do not have the opportunity to impact as many lives as we are. So people understand that when they come to work every day, it's not about the job that's in front of them. It's not about the task necessarily that you know they're doing from this time to this time. 
It's about the role that they're playing in helping people change their life and, and making the world a just healthier, more right. positive, productive, better place. I cannot tell you, I don't even know if you realize like how powerful what you just said is going to be to a lot of people because I can't tell you how many people I know personally that are business owners that are scared to grow their people and fear that they're going to go off on their own and they invested all of this money. So into them. that should be your goal. That should Absolutely. be your goal. If you're focusing on that, like you're fucking losing, like not only are you not doing what you're supposed to be doing, okay, you're spending all this energy, this what if shit. No, like, like, yeah, what if they do? What if they do? What does that mean? Okay, let's kind of reverse engineer that. That means that mm -hmm. you've spent a significant amount of time, money, and resources developing this person, turning them into a certified fucking badass. If they get to a point where they've attracted a new, better opportunity, if they're able to go open up a shop, that means that they have developed skills and experience under your watch during their tenure with your company, which would directly benefit your fucking company. That That's means right. that they've, that means they've brought up and they've developed other people around them, either through their direct leadership or just the example that they've set. So like anytime you have like an, like an all-star within a company and they're around a team, like the whole rest of the team, like that person could be probably, you know, never really even speak to the rest of the team, just hypothetically. But mm -hmm. if they're working really, really hard, working really fast, doing an awesome job, keeping a really good positive attitude all the time, that transcends and rubs off on the other people. So not only do you get the I guess the impact and the benefit from that individual that you've developed, you have the organic result that kind of just spreads throughout the organization. So like your goal should be to get the people within your organization so fucking good that literally they are able to get a better opportunity somewhere else. And then guess what happens? Then you have people that are going out in the world that are praising you, that are acknowledging you that like, and now, now you have a reputation of being that guy or girl that people like you get the Midas touch people come to your company you turn them to fucking gold they become rock stars they either you know rise in the ranks in the company or they rise in the ranks and go somewhere else and that's just a system that's ongoing and continuous so like that's just the wrong mindset that's a fixed mindset and, that's uh, right i it's sad it's like people wonder why they're not growing well what the fuck are you doing to grow that's well, seriously, right. what are you doing to grow like you're not people saying oh well, how are you marketing Oh, word of mouth, dude, come on. As convenient as it would be for all of us to open up a business and just put the responsibility of like the outside world to grow our business for us, like it doesn't work that way. Now, word That's of right. mouth is very effective and very powerful, but it has to be earned. It has to be earned. So like if you are not forcing that result, if you're not overwhelming your customers with an experience, with service, with just doing just an, an overwhelmingly positive, good job to the point where they feel compelled to do a post about your company on social media. They feel compelled to tell everybody they come into contact with how fucking awesome your customer service is, how great your product is. Like you don't deserve for people to spread the word and you don't, you will not get the, the result of, you know, word of mouth advertising. It's, a, it's the same thing. Like you get out of your business what you put into it, okay? You get out of your team what you put into them. You get out of like the word of mouth what you put into it. What are you doing? to get the results that you want. I think, you know, a lot of people have very high, unreasonable, uh, not unreasonable, it's okay to be unreasonable, unrealistic, like expectations of right. what they do versus, you know, what they're expecting to get. Absolutely. Man, this is gold, seriously. And so I have one last question. And then if you don't mind, I want to get into like just really quick rapid fire questions for like two, three yep. So my last question is just how you took your business from seven to eight figures and just what your role is now. You know, is it like to scale? Is it developing systems and processes? Is your role? I can imagine how difficult that is, but I, I really just want to see, you know, how your role has changed a little bit over the last couple of years as you've gotten bigger, what you primarily you know, tackle now and just what made the biggest difference from taking you to the seven to eight figure mark? Yeah. So developing the culture after I got in trouble, I think I maybe got off track earlier when I was uh, about to go this direction. No problem. Apologize for that. After I got in trouble, that's when I, again, basically re like I was, I was basically starting my business mm -hmm. over again, different new approach, me fully committed, me there every day. Basically I, started developing a culture. Now, it, this is in the beginning of 2016 and the end of 2016 is when I implemented our company's mission statement and our company core values. 
that was a big deal. That kind of allowed us to kind of shape the future and shape what would inevitably be the catalyst to help us really become the brand that we are today and, and become known for the things that we are today. And I know that that's like a thing that people might not like really like think like, oh, how, how could that make you grow? Well, like if you want to have a company that people actually want to work for, if you want good fucking people that are actually inspired to come to work every day and pumped up to do the job that is put in front of them on a continuous basis, they have to have a reason for that. They have to know that they're part of something that is bigger than themselves. They have to understand the impact. It's like, you know, not only do we have, you know, thousands and thousands of people that we've helped change their lives, you know, like everyday people, but, you know, we have a ton of like, you know, awesome customers that are celebrities, professional athletes, like people like, you know, you see on TV all the time. So that's pretty cool for like, you know, an employee, a team member at Nutrition Solutions to be preparing meals for like somebody, like one of their favorite athletes, like Rob Gronkowski, right? Like we had right. some Patriots fans and Gronk, obviously he's retired now. It's like for a Patriots fan to be sitting there preparing meals for somebody like Gronk, like that is like the ultimate right. like feeling of like fulfillment. So like we just have that on so many levels and like that's what you have to make people believe in what you're doing. You have to paint the picture. And it's like, look, it feels good to know that you're coming into work every day and changing lives. And look, you might not have a business where you're necessarily changing lives the way that we are, but maybe, you know, maybe you're doing something with, uh, you know, computer programming, which is making the, the exchange of information a lot more fluid, which allows people to keep in contact faster, allows people to, you know, basically reach and explore other opportunities and other possibilities that they weren't ever able to do. And, you know, because of the work that you and your team put in, you know, businesses are able to scale, more jobs are, be, are able to be created and, you know, just lives are impacted in a positive, productive way. Like you have to have a mission. And, you know, up until that point, I really did not. I mean, I had a mission in my head, but I, it wasn't something that I shared with the team. And again, that was a result of poor leadership. You know, and then once we started doing that, we started to grow and, and, and then, you know, you get to a point where like you're growing and then things are really fucked up in the back end because you don't have processes in place that support the growth. So then, yeah, then you have to buckle down and you have to create standard operating procedures. And then, like, that's an overwhelming thing. I mean, it was overwhelming for me at the time because like you get used to just kind of shooting from the hip all the time. And it's that's like, right. when you, when you do that, like you might get away with it for a while, but eventually it gets to the point where you, it's physically impossible to do that. You know, what I suggest to anybody, again, like if you're at a point where you're just kind of shooting from the hip, understand that like most times it's like your back is against the wall and then you have to make these changes. And well, I advise not waiting to get to that point because not only is it hard, it's stressful and it sucks and all that, but by not having SOPs in place, by not having processes in place, you're actually operating super inefficiently right now. And you're probably just not aware of it. Just because you're getting the job done, just because you're even doing a good job, if you're not following a regimented system and everybody's not on the same page, you're losing money, you're losing efficiency. There's inconsistencies between the work that's being done. And again, like take my advice from somebody who didn't do it. I didn't do right. it the right way. So I had the ultimate perspective when we did start doing it the right way. So you got to get your processes in place and you have to, you have to train, you have to train the team, which again, that was a huge addition at that time, the beginning of 2017, we started, you know, training, you know, three, four days a week. Now we train in some capacity every single day. But as far as my role, I mean, look, man, I had to learn to detach from certain things. I had to learn to delegate better. There were certain things that I used, there were certain things that I used to do that I never thought that I would ever not do. I thought that I was stuck doing it forever and I, I fucking despised it. But I just, in my mind, I didn't think you got to just take all that. You have to understand that literally like you're not that special. And there's like most of what you're doing right now is tasks and responsibilities that should be delegated because, you know, you might be able to do it now and you might be able to keep up with it right now. But that energy that you're spending on these tasks that you could be delegating and training someone to do or, you know, paying someone else to do, that's taking away your energy to strategic plan. That's taking away your energy to figure out a creatively market. That's taking your energy away from actively recruiting, like, you know, key players. And then, you know, that's another thing. You've got to find good people, but, you know, good people aren't going to, you know, aren't going to jump into an organization with, right. with people who aren't good. So developing the culture and the ecosystem within was the primary catalyst and, you know, developing the people within put us in a position where we're able to uh, essentially attract more good people and just kind of continue 
on that path. And, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing is getting good people in place to, to handle the day to day. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, you can focus on what you're supposed to be doing, which is growing the business, not working in the business. And I know it's super difficult. I mean, look, man, I'm like listening to your questions and, and hearing the way you're, you're talking about me. Like it is obvious to me that, you know, there are things that I'm responsible for, not responsible. There are things that I do right now that would probably blow your mind as far as some of the things that I'm not like by any means, like on easy street, like feet up and chilling, like, you know, CEO, like fucking never, like bro, I'm actively involved in my business. You know, I'm, right. I'm constantly raising the standard. I'm constantly looking to get better. That's just my, that's my thing. That's like my thesis. And, you know, we, we just brought in some new people uh, some months back, some, you know, uh, key A players. And, you know, I'm, I'm working with these guys to develop them like, so we can get where, you know, we're going a lot faster. And, you know, there's a lot of bullshit that I have to deal with. You deal with complacency. You deal with people that are, you know, that fall off track. And you have to help get them back on track. You deal with things that, I mean, look, man, we have a family environment. And, you know, I care very much about this team. Our culture is, is one that, it's all the things that I mentioned, but, you know, above all else, we're a family. So you do deal with some personal things from time to time. And that's the thing when you invest as heavily into your people the way that I do, which again, I don't recommend it for everybody. I mean, sure. it's not, it's not for everybody. This is a decision that I've made to kind of make peace with my reckless past and just to, to this, this is what I want for my life. But you know, the fact is when you heavily invest into the people the way you do, you invest feelings, there's emotions and there's just some personal stuff that you have to deal with as well. So it's like, right. it's still hard. It's still, it's still a struggle. It's always is. That's what it is. That's business, man. If you want to get better, you have to get better. I mean, it's, it's, yep. it's as simple as that. And, you know, with me, like now between my personal brand, you know, I started to make moves with my personal brand over the last year, things have been going like pretty good as far as like me getting just a lot of press and, and just doing a lot of like high caliber interviews. And started my podcast five months ago, which took me, you know, two years longer than what I wanted to, to get it going. But, but, you know, now like I'm fortunate to be in a position where like my personal brand is actually helping my business grow. So what, you know, I'm trying to trying to figure out is the, the the way to get to where I can spend most of my time doing the things that actually I enjoy. The majority of my time doing the things that I enjoy that fucking pump me up, and spend less time doing the things that stress me out. And that Absolutely. is that's the goal, like for everybody, and it always will be. And it like some of the things that I'm you know doing now that I actually probably enjoy doing. I'll probably get to a point where I'm realizing like, shit. That's not these. That's not the best use of my time. I have to delegate that. I have to move up to the next thing. And it's, it's just a process, man. It's ongoing. Like your journey when you're focused and committed and you're doing the most important work, which is the self-education, That's right. you increase your level of awareness and consciousness and you realize things that you're doing that like either aren't very good or just could be done better. And every fucking day I get up, I ask myself, okay, what can I do today to just get a little better? How can I do things a little better? How can I become more effective? How can I help someone become more efficient? And then, you know, when you have that mindset, it's a growth mindset. Like things just evolve. And, you know, like I, I look at things that, you know, I, I often come across things within the company that I'm like, this sucks. Like who, who fucking did this? Like who, who signed off on this? And they're like, actually you did. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't like it anymore. Let's fix it. And My like, consciousness be better. is, is be expanded. Better. Let's change this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like honestly, that happens all the time. And it's like, that is okay. That's how it should be. I mean, if that's not happening, like, that means something's wrong. Man, you can't imagine how helpful like this, every bit of this interview is. And I'm going to cut the rapid fire questions down super short. Just yeah, let's go, man. It's all good. Time. So I just have a few. I'm going to fire them off really quickly. And I'm going to end with one that I just want to know personally. You know, the yeah. first one is, how do you rank having mentors to success? And who is one of your mentors? Or is there anybody that you model yourself after? Yeah, mentors is really important. However, people need to not worry about you know, getting wrapped up about the fact they don't have someone that meets with them, you know, every Thursday at 7 p.m., you know, at the library or whatever the fuck. Like, mentors are all available in abundance through social media, through podcasts, through YouTube, you know, through just, it's, look, it's 2019. There's never been a better time because you have all of these really successful people that are crushing it, that are now sharing their knowledge, most of which is for free. So you have the opportunity to have to handpick your mentors and be mentored by people that are the best at individual things. So like people get wrapped up. They think they need somebody to come hold their fucking hand, tell them what to do, what not to do. Oh, don't do this, dude. Nobody's going to do the work for you. If you're somebody who is like tripping and, and, and stressed because you don't have a mentor, 
Like this shit might not be for you. Like you don't have the right mindset because you have all the fucking mentors. Mentorship is important, but it's not. I think that that gets confused as far as what that actually means. Now, if you are fortunate to have somebody that is willing to invest their time into you, that's great. But you should still also be doing the other things as well. But also understand that, you know, like people aren't like people who are kind of sought after for mentorship. Like they're busy. Like if you are just some random average person that brings this person zero fucking value, like you cannot responsibly expect somebody who's busy. There's a lot of shit going on to just fucking spend their time and, and, and energy like into you. Like, like honestly, who are you like to, to have that expectation? That's a, that's a very shitty entitled mindset. And I, I see it all the time. I mean, I, I have right. people that hit me up, but, but they don't know. That's the thing. Like they're not aware, they're not aware of it. They're not aware that that's what they're doing, but you know, there are ways to get people like to help you to gate like, but you have to like, don't just be firing off questions to people like, do something of value, like do something productive, send somebody a handwritten thank you card telling them the impact that they made on your life with a little gift, like a little gift of something that is significant to them. Like if they went to college somewhere and maybe something that has to do with the school, you know, maybe like I had someone recently send me awesome handwritten thank you card and he sent me a bracelet. I wear like a bracelet on my watch hands with my watch. And I don't know how, like, I don't really show my watch very much on like on, on my social media but this dude took a note of that he sent me a new bracelet he's like hey uh i saw your bracelet was like a little worn out so i went ahead and i made you this one i'm like man that that's like that's awesome and that guy got my attention so like right. you know things like that but the, the thing is mentorship is important but you know don't worry about if you don't have somebody to to sit you down or to, to speak on the phone with you you know whenever like just look out there and anybody who you want to be like anybody who's crushing it that you feel like you could learn from well consume their information and then execute on it. And then guess what? They're your fucking mentor. Absolutely. Man, you crushed that question. Okay. Two more questions. Number two is if you could have lunch with anyone on earth that's still alive, who would that be? I always say still alive because (laughs) before it was anybody and 99% of people were like Jesus. And so (laughs) who would that person be? It's a good question. Or top three, just anybody that comes to mind. Probably, probably Michael Jordan or Mike Tyson. That's that's awesome. And then my final question, and I just want to get your take on this, just because it's such a debated question, is you know, yep. what is your honest opinion on the keto diet? <laughs> so I think that we live in a very instant gratification society. I think that people are always looking for a quick fix and a shortcut. And like, listen, like I've spoken about this a lot. And, you know, I've, I've done interviews about this and everybody wants to, you know, hear me go off about it. It's like every time I do it, you know, there's always like this backlash from these people like, oh, well, the keto diet works for me. It's like, okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll see. The, the fact is like the quick fix mindset with anything is never the best way. I don't care if we're talking about the foods that you're putting in your body, you know, scaling your business, becoming a, you know, better with your relationships. There is no, there's not one scenario in the universe in any situation that going into something with a quick fix mindset is the right way. Like when you make the conscious decision to change your eating habits, because you just get to the point where you're disgusted with the way you look, with the way you feel, your confidence is suffering and all that. Like you have to recognize that, you know, it took you however long it took you, probably a pretty long time to to get to that point, to to accrue that extra weight, that body fat, that, you know, that low low levels of confidence and self-esteem. It's unreasonable to think that you're going to start eating quote unquote well via the keto diet or this low carb, whatever fad diet happens to be hot or trending at the time. It's unreasonable to think that you're going to do that. And then all this weight and this, like these unhealthy practices that you've been building up for years is just going to go away in a short period of time. And it's unfortunate that people just they're looking for that quick fix, that pill, the keto diet. That's right. The fact is we need to set our nutrition up for longevity, for sustainability. And the fact is the keto diet is not sustainable for most people. It's not sustainable for most people and it's actually not even advantageous for most people. Like if you're maybe like older and live a set sedentary lifestyle, mm-hmm. perhaps, right? But unless you're like really if you're like somewhat active and you know, like you're working out, you're like kind of you know, running around, keeping up with your family, unless you're able to get really like locked in 
and like kind of just understand like how much exactly how much fats that you need for your body type and macro counting and all that like you're not going to be able to do the you're going to think you're doing the keto diet but you're actually not it's going to get to a point where it becomes it becomes realistically uh, unrealistic to sustain and, and you know unfortunately i've i mean i'm in the industry man like look i own a company that sells healthy meals so like i could very easily be like, oh yeah, keto diet, keto diet, like and would take advantage of everybody's like, you know, quick fix mindset. And I could capitalize and could cash in off that financially. But the fact is like, I want people to realize that this isn't a quick fix. This isn't something that, you know, you just do for, this is like the foods that we put in our mouth are essentially what dictate our quality of life. They dictate how we feel. They dictate how we look. They dictate how we perform. It dictates our confidence, dictates our self-esteem, our sex drive, our mental acuity, our ability to focus, our ability to just be in a positive mood. All of these things are objectively influenced on a very high level by the quality of the food that we put in our mouth. So, you know, we have to look at the health or we have to look at our health as a priority. It has to be the top priority. The foods that you put in your mouth, your health, it's more important than your family. It's more important than your friends. It's more important than your job because if you're not taking care of you, if you're not setting yourself up to live your best life, then you're not going to be able to help anyone else live their best life or be able to provide the best life for your family. So I just implore people who might think the keto is a good option to really explore your like real deep down reasonings to want to do it. Is it because you think fats are more, I, I guess fats will, will be more consistent with your lifestyle on this, or is it because you heard that someone who did the keto diet lost a bunch of weight in a short period of time and you're chasing those results? Because the part of that that you're failing to understand is the most important and compelling part of the story is 90 fucking 5% of the people who've lost a dramatic amount of weight on the keto diet ultimately end up gaining it all back and then some. And that is not good. That's not good for your confidence, not good for your mindset. And it completely skews your perspective with the whole, you know, the eating well process. And it just will cause you to just be like, oh, well, fuck it, whatever. I'm not saying there isn't people who haven't had success with the keto diet. I'm sure that there, I mean, I know that there's, I know people, but I also know that these people are like just fucking locked in, just scientific regimented on it. That's like right. Every two and a half hours, man, they're fucking eating and they're, and they're, they're, they're measuring out the amount of fats. Like they're fucking on it. And dude, most people don't have the time for that shit. Like they just don't. I mean, look around our society, 75% of the adult population is overweight or obese. So people don't have time or they think they don't have time, whatever. They don't, they're not making it a priority. Make things easier on yourself. Get on a nutrition yes. program that is easy to keep up with. Enjoy a variety of foods you can literally eat anything like again that would kind of fall under the healthy category we know it's healthy we know it's not right cut out the soda cut out the bullshit drink a lot of water eat a lot of vegetables you know lean protein just make sure you're practicing portion control eat consistently throughout the day don't go all day without eating and then think that you're going to not like not end up gaining body fat because we go all day without eating we get so hungry we eat everything that's inside like oh i only ate once today yeah but you consumed fucking like thousands of calories and then beyond that your body because it's not getting consistently given the fuel that it needs it's going to hold on to those calories and store it as body fat because you're feeding it so inconsistently so you got to make things easy on yourself eat foods right. that you enjoy practice portion control and make sure that you know you have variety in your life and you're not focused on what you can eat and you know basically restricting and, and having a predicament where you're setting up yourself for for massive failure right there needs to be a diet is not something that we need to be concerned with. That's not a word that we use in our company. It's not something that I, people like when in society, I believe diet has a negative stigma to it. I think diet, it's like, oh, I'm like, oh, like, oh, like, no, like, you don't need a diet. You need a lifestyle change. You need a nutrition program that allows you to look, feel, and perform your best. And that is easy to keep up with. And following a diet that, you know, basically you have to urinate on a stick to like f figure out if it's working or not probably isn't the best option. That's man, that like you killed that question. I really appreciate that. And no I problem. just want to thank you so much for your time. And I want to close with this, you know, number one, what's the best way for people to follow you? And number two, if somebody, cause I know a lot of people listening to this, including myself are going to want to know, like, if we want to be healthier through your company, where do we start? Because I mean, there's a lot of options out there, but I don't think I've sure. ever met anyone that owns a company that cares as much about people, which means I know you'll, 
you just, you do a great job with everything. So how can people follow you? How can people get started if they want to make some lifestyle changes through nutritionsolutions.com? Yeah. So on Instagram, at Chris Cavallini, same thing on Facebook. If, you know, digging the vibe here, you can check out my podcast, the Start Today podcast. It's uh, available anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Uh, yeah, the company is called Nutrition Solutions. Just to, to lead, you do not need my company to get in shape, right? People have been getting in shape for decades, centuries, you know, even arguably, you know, we just make it a little easier. I mean, if you're someone who has the time, the knowledge, and discipline to do it on your own, like, great. Like, that's awesome. Rock on. We're basically in the business of helping people change their life and just streamlining the process. Um, entrepreneurs are busy. People who are, you know, of the entrepreneur mindset are busy. And, you know, whether you own a business or not, like if you have a growth mindset, like, you know, that's the entrepreneur mindset, in my opinion. You know, we need to delegate the things that aren't the best use of our time. And, you know, we have a lot of business owners and a lot of professional athletes and such that don't necessarily have that time or have the time, but they need to be focusing on other things. So, I mean, look, like we make the process of, you know, eating well, feeling good, looking good, a lot easier. And, you know, if you're someone who needs help with that, the company is called Nutrition Solutions at Nutrition Solutions on Instagram. And the website is uh, nutritionsolutions.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Mentor Nation, and I hope that you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. If you know anyone looking to get fit, lose weight, or stay on top of their meal prep, just send them over to nutritionsolutions.com and they will take really, really good care of you. One more thing, if you enjoyed the show, please, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or just wherever you're listening, and please share this episode with someone or anyone that you think might find value. You would not believe how helpful that is in these early stages, and I will personally forever be grateful. Thank you again, and we'll see you on next week's episode.